Thank you very much for coming to attend this <coughs> event uh, in honor of Omer Basha. Uh, and it gives me great pleasure to uh, have known both the Basha family, especially Fatima, who's uh, been a great encouragement in uh, doing wonderful things around the world. Uh, her contributions here at MIT as well as in Pakistan are commendable and have influenced many of us. And at the same time, uh, knowing Dr. Atao Rahman, who has also helped uh, Dr. Basha in accomplishing many of her dreams in Pakistan. Uh, but it was my distinct pleasure uh, in so uh, about five years that I spent in Pakistan trying to also uh, help Pakistan enhance its science and engineering skill set, uh, where I got to know Dr. Atao. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, you to him and have him tell us more about the latest in higher education in Pakistan. Dr. Atar himself is an accomplished, one of the most accomplished and celebrated scientists from Pakistan. Uh, he got his PhD from Cambridge University in Organic Chemistry back in 1968. And since then, being a prolific writer, he has authored over 900 publications, 116 books of them, uh, some 65 book chapters. Uh, he also has 27 patents to his credit. I was just trying to figure out what I should say when I introduce him and I went to the Wikipedia page to look up his bio and it's like eight pages, so I'm trying to summarize. <laughs> um, um, he's won numerous awards, both from Pakistani government, uh, numerous uh, scientific organizations around the world. Uh, he's a fellow of the Royal Society in London. Uh, as you can guess, the list goes on and on. Uh, the context in which I met Dr. Atta was when he was the chairman of the Higher Education Commission, which was a body set up about a decade, a little over a decade ago, to try and improve the higher education system in Pakistan. I think it had a tremendous impact on the country uh, from being probably one of the, the least developed in higher education in the world. Uh, Pakistan suddenly became a role model for many developing countries. Uh, and I, uh, I think Dr. Azhar is in a great position to tell us how he achieved that and what more can be done. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Azhar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
happened in this institution uh, over the years to come. In the next uh, uh, 17 or 18 minutes, I, I'll be telling you about a little uh, dream of my own and how I have tried to contribute towards trying to turn that into a reality. And uh, you see, the challenge for Pakistan is that we have uh, about 54% of the population of Pakistan is below 19. A population of 180 or so million, about 100 million uh, are below 19. And so that is the future of our country. If we want to progress, we have to unleash the creative potential that lies therein. Uh, through quality education, through science, technology, and through innovation and entrepreneurship. So I'm a professor of organic chemistry, and I'm not doing that all my life, except for some nine years in between when I was appointed as the Minister for Science first, and later the Minister for Higher Education, and some for a while the Minister of Education. And I persuaded President Musharraf at the time that uh, if we want to move, move this country forward, uh, the way forward is only education. And we should, we should stop looking for aid from others. Uh, we have to put our money in our children. So I persuaded him to give a 6,000% increase in the budget for science and technology, and later a 3,500% increase in the budget for higher education. And higher education commission was set up as a ministerial level body. The head of the higher education commission has the status of a federal minister and it reports directly to the Prime Minister. And as a result of that, uh, we started a large number of programs. And we, and, and we asked ourselves, can we use technology to lead from? Because, and so a number of initiatives were begun. For instance, the Pakistan Educational Research Network. If you walked into a library 10 years ago uh, in Pakistan, you would have found, hardly found even half a dozen of the latest journals. Today, every student, even in the weakest university in Balochistan or wherever, has free access to some 65,000 international journals, and, sorry, some 25,000 international journals and some 65,000 textbooks <coughs> from 120 international publishers free of charge. Huge repository of knowledge, uh, which was, so it was a digital library program. We placed Pakistan's first educational satellite in space at that time started uh, a uh, video conferencing program, so there have been more than 2,000 lectures delivered live and interactively over the last three years, for instance, uh, through the video conferencing network, and now we have a nationwide license for Microsoft Communicator Link, which means that you don't, you're free from the constraints of a video conferencing environment. You can uh, listen to the lectures back home, uh, in your home. Uh, the IT policy was formulated. Uh, IT, in, initiatives were begun, the governance programs initiated, engineering sciences were given the top priority, a number of uh, new universities were set up and the older universities strengthened. Uh, internet was, uh, I was also the minister for IT and telecom and we saw within a matter of three years internet spreading from 29 towns and cities to over 2,000 towns, cities and villages. Uh, we saw uh, the Pakistan Educational Research Network now provides one gigabit connectivity to each university, and these are then connected to 10 gigabit loops around the major cities. Uh, uh, also, dark, dark fiber going to many, many institutions, and uh, the digital library that materialized as a result provides a, a, a huge repository of knowledge. And with the University of Lund in Sweden, we developed a one window search engine. Uh, so you don't have to go to different websites. You can just search whatever you want through one window. And uh, this uh, lecturing program that was begun goes on very vigorously with less lectures from Japan and Australia and USA and Europe, uh, with students in Balochistan and Punjab asking questions. And the MIT Mirror website, the open, open access source material was set up in Pakistan about eight years ago. Uh, open courseware. And, uh, and so this is, and this uh, network of video conferencing and also the link is now uh, providing a platform to improve English language, for instance, and to students. And we have uh, these courses being delivered from the University of Sydney, for instance, Chinese language courses starting up uh, so that students in universities can now learn Chinese. Uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, the latest that's happening right now, and within this month, we will be launching Pakistan's first free 
uh, education service, uh, which will be through television and through the internet. And this is an integration of Coursera from Stanford, edX uh, from Harvard, uh, the MIT Open Courseware, Udacity, uh, the Khan Academy, and uh, the, the Open University courses in the UK. These are all being integrated together uh, so that you don't have to go to different get out of the own meta search engine. And these will be available to schools, colleges, and universities, both through television, where there will be a little box where you build your demand so you can play whatever lecture you like. And many of these courses are dubbed in Urdu, school level courses in our own language so that the school students can benefit. So there's a huge revolution, the beginning of a huge revolution. I, and I think this is perhaps the most exciting program that I'm right now involved in. Uh, this is one, you see President Musharraf uh, uh, over there, sitting there. Uh, he was visiting our center and there was this Australian professor giving one of the courses from, uh, from Sydney. And they started talking quick into the quick factory model that time. Uh, uh, this is a satellite, Pakistan, an educational satellite which has footprints across uh, different parts of the world. And uh, as I said, uh, we have uh, about 54% of our population is uh, below 19. And the challenge is to train them, to send them to top universities across the world, and then attract them back, not through legal bonds, but through creating an enabling environment. Who doesn't want to come back home, uh, provided they have the opportunities to contribute? So we made, uh, and, and so it's, it's, it's a combination of access to literature, access to instrumentation, uh, salaries, research funding, and clustering of people, a critical mass in different institutions. Uh, and so we made a dramatic change in salary structures. Pakistan probably became the first country in the world where the salary of a professor became about five times the salary of a federal minister in the government. Sorry. And uh, uh, however, just uh, giving high salaries to weak people would just have been a waste of money. So it was a 10-year track system that we brought in. So you have to be on contract for three years. And then uh, you were internationally evaluated for another three years. And then if you did good work, uh, then you could be have a permanent job. Uh, the students that we sent abroad, most of our money was spent in sending large number of students uh, across the world. Some 11,000 students sent uh, for PhD studies at top universities across the world. Uh, we started the world's largest Fulbright program, for instance, and about half the funds came in from the Fulbright Foundation and half from the Higher Education Commission. We insisted on paying because we wanted to make sure that whoever went abroad were trained in fields that were relevant to our needs. And, uh, and so uh, these students have come back in large numbers and have made huge changes uh, in Pakistan, as I will be describing to you. Uh, about a year before they were about they were going to return, each had an opportunity of winning, of winning grants of $100,000. So even if they came back to a relatively weak university, they would have the opportunity to carry out research because we said the universities are not about beautiful buildings, they are about beautiful minds. Universities are judged by creativity and uh, by the new barriers of knowledge as you here at MIT do. Uh, that they are able to bring. So they were, and to bring it about within a short period of eight or ten years was a big challenge. But uh, uh, we, we, the students that we sent abroad, uh, we had a three-tier system under which the first they had to have a high, very good academic career. Secondly, we had a national exam. About 15 or 20 thousand students would appear at this very highly competitive exam. The best 500 would be shortlisted, and then they'd be interviewed by foreign professors from countries that they were supposed to go abroad. So it was a very merit-based selection. And we had glowing letters from their supervisors who said, we haven't seen such students from anywhere in the world, uh, and we want more. Uh, we start, you've all heard of open access journals. Uh, I had this idea of open access instrumentation. Uh, and we became probably, again, the first in the world to in implement this idea. Uh, and the idea was very simple. It was that. Uh, you don't have to have these sophisticated NMR and mass spectrometers and X-ray machines and what have you in your own lab. Uh, any researcher in the country can send his samples for analysis to any institution of his or her choice. The analysis would be done within 72 hours, and uh, they will get the results. 
uh, there will be a bill generated, but the bill will go to the higher education ministry. So it will be a free access to instrumentation to the entire uh, research community in Pakistan. And that was one of the uh, reasons we already had this sudden uh, burst of research activity in Pakistan. Uh, so a billion dollars was spent on foreign scholarships, uh, uh, teachers training programs, uh, intensive teacher, teacher training programs initiated for the existing teachers. And then we saw something which well, the World Bank its report has called a silent revolution occurring in Pakistan. Uh, in 2003, in the 50, Pakistan was formed in 1947, and in the subsequent 55 years, we had, uh, we had an enrollment in 2003 of only 270,000 students. That has now grown over to over a million in, in a matter of uh, nine years. The number of universities has gone up from 59 to 137 universities. The male-female disparity, the, the gap has narrowed. It's only plus or minus 3%. The green are the, uh, are the men and the red are the women, so it's evened out. Uh, the PhD output, that's a very interesting slide. Uh, this is the year-wise output of PhDs from Pakistan. And, and, and so we had only produced about 3,200 of PhDs in the first 55 years. And then with this emphasis on research, access to research grants, linking promotions to your creativity, we, had this, uh, we have this sharply increasing output of PhDs. So now it's about uh, 5,500 have been produced. Uh, but Numbers without quality would be a disaster. So we insisted that every thesis had to be evaluated by two or three experts in technologically advanced countries, and only when there was a unanimity of opinion would there be a local exam held. And secondly, plagiarism was completely stopped by the distribution of identicate and Turnitin and so on to, uh, to all the universities. So every paper, every thesis has to go through this uh, process to ensure that there's no plagiarism. Uh, international research publications have jumped, jumped up and we are about the same as India now today on the research publications per million population. It's always good to compare with India because we have the same kind of an environment and set up. Uh, so in 2002 we were about seven or 800 publications as opposed to 35,000 from India. Uh, the year that just finished uh, we have reached 8,000 as compared to 54,000 from India. So on a per million population basis comparable now. Uh, the Pakistan share of world articles has uh, tripled and continues to grow. Uh, and uh, there were six Pakistani universities were ranked amongst the top 300 to 500 in the world. Still not amongst the top 100. That's I think another 15 or 20 years of concerted effort. But at least we had none before. So there's a sharp transition taking place. And so we are moving in the right direction. The Royal Society in London, of which I happen to be a fellow, has produced a book on the Islamic world called A New Golden Age. And it talks about the transformation that is occurring in many countries. They say that Pakistan is the best example of uh, uh, best practice which can be followed by other developing countries on how to improve uh, science and run the past price for institution building. Uh, and in 2011, uh, we were ranked amongst the, the, the microbiology and plant and animal science, and we were ranked as first in two of these areas. This, this is Science Watch. It, it tells you on the basis of the change, the delta uh, that, that's taking place. And so we have, and this is the Austrian Awards. So Nature has written uh, four editorials about what has happened. The first uh, was published in 2007. And that was entitled The Paradox of Pakistan. And, and it said this is this strange country torn by terrorism and strife and all these problems that you hear about in newspapers. And yet in this same country, you have this wonderful program uh, in higher education which can be emulated by others. The second was soon after President Musharraf left. And that's what that was published in Nature on 28th August. And the heading was After Musharraf. And it said, don't go back to the Stone Age that existed before. And uh, so the, uh, the, the government should pursue the policies uh, that they have been doing. And there were two more editorials uh, commenting what has happened. Interestingly, uh, there was an article published in, uh, in the Hindustan Times uh, entitled Park Threat to, Indi to, uh, to Indian Science. And this was published on 23rd of July 2006. And uh, this uh, was a result of Professor C.N.R. Rao, who is a dear friend. We had given a presentation to the Indian Prime Minister about the rapid changes that were taking place 
uh, in Pakistan, and it uh, started with the words Pakistan is going to China. In, but uh, India and Pakistan have so much to work together for. We have a commonality of problem. We have to fight together, not against each other. We have to fight together as comrades in arms against hunger and poverty and all the uh, other things that afflict us. And so here is a historic photograph where I invited, I happen to be the president of the Pakistan Academy of Sciences, and invited, I invited uh, Dr. Krishan Lal, who is the president of the Indian National Science Academy, INSA, and he came to Pakistan along with his colleagues, and we have signed an agreement of cooperation, and I said, let's work together in science, and we are already developing a number of programs to collaborate together in different fields of science. So, uh, the impact you can already see the number, the, the, the quality of universities has improved. Still, we are not amongst the top, but at least we are, uh, we are pointing in the right direction. Uh, I was also responsible for uh, telecommunications, and so mobile telephony, for instance, was not expanding in Pakistan. Uh, one of the reasons was at that time, I'm talking about 2002, that the calls were too expensive, so we brought the rates down sharply and uh, introduced competition. And people were reluctant to have a mobile phone because they had to pay for receiving a call. So the common man was reluctant that oh, I'm paying for somebody else's call. So we switched that over, and it was a, brought in the calling party pays regime, so that if you're, you don't pay anything for receiving a party. And that, there were only about uh, 300,000 mobile phones at that time, 0.3 million. Now it's 110 million mobile phones, and continues to grow. It became the important sector of the economy. And there are many students who have returned after their PhDs under different programs and uh, companies. There was a company which was a care which is in Islamabad. They won a contract for $250 million uh, a couple of years ago for some of the work in the IT. Uh, unfortunately, some, in the last five years, there have been turbulence. The new government that came in in the last five years, there were politicians with forged degrees and they tried to destroy this uh, wonderful institution. I had already resigned and left five years ago. Uh, and uh, there were notifications issued uh, to fragment ATC, uh, but uh, I then went to the Supreme Court of Pakistan and I won, won twice and that prevented uh, the destruction of ATC. Uh, so the future of Pakistan, uh, ATC being the higher education, sorry. the future of Pakistan lies in our children, as I said, we have, as is the, as is the future of in the USA. It is the quality of education that you provide, it's uh, the opportunities that you provide them to contribute to the development of your own countries rather than looking at apparently greener pastures elsewhere. And it is uh, the value that you place on knowledge and on society. Uh, education, and as, uh, education brings in moderation. And education uh, tells you that you have, uh, teaches you to differ like gentlemen or gentle ladies uh, from in, uh, without taking a gun and trying to shoot everybody because you don't uh, understand or agree to their point of view. So the key to future prosper prosperity of Pakistan uh, lies in education. Uh, I am very, very happy that uh, the Ministry of Science and Technology could contribute also towards this dream of Fatima uh, and Anwar uh, to build this institute. This institute is now has, uh, is buzzing with students. Uh, it's a live place. Uh, it's a dream come true. Uh, however, it needs quality faculty. It needs strong <coughs> linkages, and that is where I think uh, we pretty much like to work closely with, uh, with MIT in particular and with other, other institutions to make it all happen. I'm delighted to be here and very humbled to be invited. Thank you.